being from the book of Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. I know we're doing things backwards today, but I'm reading from the psalm number eight for today, just because I like it. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Congregation may be seated. Well, God made all the fathers too along with all the other things that God made. So just a, as a kind of a beginning, I'm going to share a couple of little things about Father's Day. From the Family Circus cartoon, one boy is saying to another boy, I can't come over to your house tomorrow. It's Father's Day and I have to stay home and play with my dad. <laughs> yeah. The father was at the beach with his children when the four-year-old son ran up to him, grabbed his hand, and led him to the shore where a seagull lay dead in the sand. Daddy, what happened to him? The son asked. He died and went to heaven, the dad replied. The boy thought for a moment, then he said, did God throw him back down? You know, uh, for those of us who are fathers and have had lots and lots of fun raising our kids, I just have a little note here. It says, they say that sound travels slower than light. It must be so. For most of the things I explained to my teenage kids didn't get to them until they were in their (laughs) mid-40s. Like that one? That's about as true as it gets, isn't it? And then this is, this is one I really like, and then, then we're done. Walk a little plainer, Daddy, said a little boy, so frail. I'm following in your footsteps, and I don't want to fail. Sometimes your steps are very plain. 
Sometimes they're hard to see. So walk a little player, Danny, Daddy, for you are leading me. I know that once you walked this way many years ago, and what you did along the way, I'd really like to know. For sometimes when I'm tempted, I don't know what to do. So walk a little plainer, Daddy, for I must follow you. Someday when I'm grown up, you are like I want to be then I will have a little boy who will want to follow me. And I would want to lead him right and help him to be true. So walk a little plainer, Daddy, for we must follow you. Well, fathers and mothers, I hope you have a great day. My wish for today is that I get to go to a baseball game. And so I'm hoping the sun comes out. <laughs> My brother-in-law is also a father today, so we're going to both run out and watch this wonderful team we have here. The only thing that makes it really, really wonderful is that they're uh, twins. They're a twins farm team, and I'm a twins fan. Well, I'm going to be uh, reading a letter to you today that I have written to God. Dear God, I've been meaning to write for a long time. I've had a few questions for you about you. Like, who are you? Where did you come from? Why are you here? And why is it that I can't actually see you? And I've read a lot of things about you. I've read how you talked to a lot of people in the past. And I've wondered what your voice really sounds like. I have a little book on my bookshelf that's written about what little children would like to know about you. And I think that a lot of those questions were actually written by adults. Here's one I remember. Dear Pastor, when is God's birthday? I would like to send him a present. Love, Arlene, age eight. Or this one. Dear Pastor, did God make girls smarter than boys? My big sister says so. Yours truly, Ryan. Then there's my favorite. Do you think God knows my name? Even my teacher doesn't know my name. And I've been in her class for two years. <laughs> Sincerely, Franklin, age 10. You need to change schools, kid. Well, I think I'm probably just reading around the bush with these silly questions, God. So uh, I'll get right to, the question, right to the real reason for this le letter to you. I have a lot of things on my mind today. In our branch of the Christian church, we occasionally talk about the Holy Trinity. I know you know this, but I need to write about it today so that perhaps I can more fully understand it. So bear with me, okay? I am a Lutheran. So I know that you will understand it takes Lutherans a little longer to catch on than some others. We have to kind of chew on things a while and, and, and debate them and write opinion pages and then debate again and again before we're able to come to any kind of agreement. Well, in my studies to become a Lutheran pastor, I learned that this is how this whole idea of the Trinity got developed. Some of the early theologians of the Christian church taught that Jesus was merely a man and not the Son of God. Now, in order to correct the teaching on this subject, meetings were held by the most educated Christians in the known world in order to debate this. Out of those discussions came what we now call the Apostles' Creed. I know you know all this, but I'm just doing it just so I can kind of catch up. Some people today think that it was called the Apostles' Creed because the first apostles wrote it. Actually, that would have been a good trick if that were true because the Apostles' Creed wasn't written or agreed to until 321 years after the birth of Jesus. The apostles would have been quite old by then. I also heard somewhere that somebody answered the question, Who are the, what are the epistles? And they said that the epistles were the wives of the apostles. <laughs> That's wrong. 
I want to write mostly about what I understand about the first part of this creed, the part we call the first article. It begins, as you know, I believe in God the Father, almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I suppose I need to remind myself that a creed is basically a statement of faith. I also remember that the first creed of the Christian faith would probably have been a statement from the New Testament that said, Jesus is Lord. If the apostles actually had a creed that was named for them, that would have been, Jesus is Lord. But that's not where I want to go in this first letter to you. I want to talk about you as Father and as Creator. I really think it's helpful to remember what Martin Luther wrote when he was asked the question, what does this mean? He actually answered that question about a lot of things. But first, I am reminded of the answer as it pertains to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, what does this mean? Luther then answered the question. He said, here God would encourage us to believe that he is truly our Father, and we are truly his children, in order that we may approach him boldly and confidently in prayer, even as beloved children approach their dear father. Now, God, you remember back in the early 80s when I was a pastor at Resurrection Church in Prairie Village, Kansas, those were the days when there was a lot of talk about being, well, using inclusive language from the pulpit. I'd been in discussion with one of my wife's sisters about always referring to you as being male, like our father. Now, I'm sure you remember that. I do. You see, she was majoring in women's studies at St. Olaf College at the time. I remember preaching a sermon after that using more inclusive language, and in that sermon I told the congregation that I was going to be more inclusive in my language, even when referring to God. That didn't go over very well, God. It was a completely new paradigm. Many people then, and still today, cannot visualize you as being anything other than male. Even though there are portions of the Bible that characterize your actions and some of your characteristics as being female. Today, as I think about this, I believe that you would want each person to visualize you in whatever form, male or female, that best fulfills one's spiritual journey. It seems to me that this would certainly help a person grow in his or her personal relationship with you. I also agree with Martin Luther when he reminds us of his answer to the question, what does this mean, as it pertains to the first article of the Apostles' Creed. This is what he said. I believe, and I know you know this already, I believe that God has created me and all that exists, that he has given me and still sustains my body and soul, all my limbs and senses, my reason and all the faculties of my mind, together with food and clothing, house and home, family and property, that he provides daily and abundantly with all the necessities of life, protects me from all danger, and preserves me from all evil. All this he does out of his pure, fatherly, and divine goodness and mercy. Without any merit or worthiness on my part, for all of this I am bound to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. Then his most famous statement, this is most certainly true. Now I've asked myself many times in my life, why me? Why was I the one to be blessed with Bob and Enid as my parents? Why did you allow me to be born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, into a safe and loving home, in a safe and economically sound community? Why did you give me an opportunity to go to good schools with textbooks available for my use and clean drinking water in every hallway? Why was I given a Christian baptism and the promise of everlasting life? Just a few questions. Since becoming a pastor, I've been given the opportunity to go on two mission trips, one in Ecuador and one in Mexico. I also had the opportunity to visit mainland China. Now on each of these trips, I saw many poor people living in surroundings that were not healthy nor very hopeful. 
I was reminded on these trips that this could have been me. Luther reminds me in his answer that nothing of what you have provided for me has been provided because I deserved it or because I earned it. You did all this and continue to do it because of your love for me. Now I know that you do not love me more than you love others. One of the questions that I have for you is, why isn't the rest of the world as blessed as I have been? Is it because you have not completed the creation of your world? Aren't you done yet? Are you waiting for me to help you finish the job? Maybe you have more faith in me and all the other Christians in the world than I have, and maybe I haven't been aware of what you've been calling me to do. Is that what Luther's last sentence in his explanation means for me? To get busy? Luther says, for all of this, I am bound to thank, praise, serve, and obey. I think I've done a lot of thinking in my life, probably not enough. And a lot of thanking in my life, but probably not enough. But I do thank you a lot. I also spend time in worship praising you for what you've done for me. And when I get to the serve part, I guess I just realized a possible answer to my earlier question. Why hasn't the rest of the world been as blessed as me? It is because you're not done creating the world, are you? You're asking for my help in finishing the job. You're waiting for me to serve and to obey so the world might be saved. You're calling me to swing the hammer, dig the well, build the schools, plant the seeds, harvest the crops and feed the hungry, heal the sick, bring sight to the blind, and hope to the hopeless. The whole creation story is not wrapped up in the book of Genesis, is it? You're still writing it, aren't you? Wow, I gotta go now and think about all this. Thanks for reading, I hope you're reading, or at least one of your angels are reading this. This is most certainly true. Sincerely yours, Denny. May the peace of God which passes all understanding guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.